Is there anything you would have done differently? We reported a true story. Our colleague Brian Williams is back in Kuwait City tonight after a close call on the skies over Iraq. Controversial Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and questions about Kavanaugh's drinking in the past. Sean Hannity, come on up, Sean Hannity. Today, Andrew Cuomo is having a moment. Hello, I am Chris Steyerwald. And I'm Eliana Johnson. Facts. Welcome to Ink Stained Wretches, where we break down what is going wrong and what is going right with the American news media. Eliana Johnson, I am very glad that you were not a panelist on my Sunday show this week, because had you been, I would you would have had to go home with nothing to show for your trouble except for one St. Patrick's Day donut. Could you eat two donuts? I don't know, but I feel like only I would have I would have a hundred percent taken that in stride. I would have been totally happy to show up and not have to do anything. Well, the in only the third week of the Hill Sunday, we due to technical problems, we were not able to broadcast the show. And I feel bad for our panelists, including our friend Matt Continetti and a number of other distinguished journalists, as well as our fine newsmaker guests who all had to stew in their own juices while the production team tried to remedy the problems. And it was not- Unsuccessfully. Not not optimal, but the the, tremendous thanks to the people who, Henna Doba and the team from The Morning Show, who basically on the fly were told, you're going to need to do another hour of television and did it and it looked great and so we'll be back on sunday morning at 10 a.m and it will be hopefully this time broadcast chris if you ever need a guest to take it in stride while they are not while there are technical troubles and don't go on the air i am your woman you're the you're the one you're you're i will be totally pleased you're our fail safe for non-airing panels all right Uh, totally we'll, we'll bear it in mind but the world needs to see you and of course hear your great insights, and look at your great hair. I I will be totally pleased to not have to speak. Let's get to our front page. Where we have second gentleman in our 2024 segment. We have second gentleman Doug Emhoff, along with the rest of the mainstream news media, going bananas over Trump's quote, unquote, anti-Semitic comment on Jewish Democrats. And Trump made said remarks, and we'll play a clip of them, to his old pal, Sebastian Gorka. Doctor, and D- whoa, whoa, doctor. Let, oh, excuse me. D- Dr. Sebastian Gorka, please. Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Let's take let's a take, uh, listen to what he said. Why do the Democrats hate Bibi Netanyahu? I actually think they hate Israel. Yes. I don't think they hate I think they hate Israel. When you see those Palestinian uh, marches, even I, I'm amazed at how many people are in those marches. And guys like Schumer see that. And to him, it's votes. I think it's votes more than anything else because he was always pro-Israel. He's very anti-Israel. Now, any Jewish person that votes for Democrats uh, – hates their religion, they hate everything about Israel, and they should be ashamed of themselves. Okay. <laughs> okay. So So Bloomberg reports that second gentleman Doug Emhoff, e.g. Jewish guy around the White House, condemned Republican Donald Trump for accusing Jews who support Democrats of hating their religion in Israel. Emhoff, who is Jewish, of course, and the husband of Vice President Kamala Harris, singled out Trump's comments on Tuesday. As President Joe Biden's team has highlighted the presumptive Republican nominee's incendiary rhetoric against minorities and immigrants, this is a toxic, uh, this is a disgusting, toxic, anti-Semitic thing to say by anyone, let alone a former president of the United States, and it must be condemned, Emhoff said during a campaign event in Omaha, Nebraska. Well, let me me tell you, when Jewish Americans know that Kamala Harris's husband went to Omaha and denounced Donald Trump. It's going to change things. This is this is this is how it's going to this is going to be big. It's going to be big. Look, Trump's remarks were not properly calibrated, as many of his remarks are not. However, I didn't see the same sort of hysteria from the media when 
Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer got up and made truly unprecedented remarks in the Senate chamber, calling on Israelis to hold new elections and essentially calling for the for the deposition of their democratically elected prime minister. And frankly, Trump has a fabulous pro-Israel record. And I I just I'm happy to defend Trump on these remarks. Yeah, but now that Um, has lowered the hammer in Omaha, I mean, (laughs) what's 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 left for Trump? But not not properly calibrated on Trump's part, but but his his pro Israel and pro pro I, he's a friend of the Jews and his pro Jewish record I think stands unimpeached. I I just wanted to focus in on on the White House's response to this. A White House spokesman said, as anti-Semitic crimes and acts of hate have increased across the world, among them the deadliest attack committed against the Jewish people since the Holocaust, leaders have an obligation to call hate what it is and bring Americans together against it. This is White House spokesman Andrew Andrew Bates. There's no justification for spreading toxic, false stereotypes that threaten fellow citizens. None. And this really got under my skin because if the White House was so concerned about the anti-Semitic crimes and acts of hate, they maybe would have mentioned it at the top of the State of the Union address where the outbreak of anti-Semitism in this country didn't even merit a mention. And so it's quite clear to me that just as Trump is using this issue for political opportunism, he wants to run as more pro-Israel than Biden and I think has a case to do so. So is the the White House is too here and they are harping on this only when it's in their political benefit. And in the State of the Union address, they did not do so because they did not believe it would be in their political benefit. Well, par- part of the thinking there, I'm sure, is that the... Democrats are counting on Trump to do their work for them with disaffected Arab American and anti-war young voters, right? And that that Trump is is remedying that problem for them. But on the other side, in the battle to keep Jewish voters, I don't think that second gentleman in Omaha is <laughs> is is going to feed the bulldog. So. I get the political calculus on both sides, but I think the uh, when it comes to the fight for the Jewish vote, we're going to see a lot. We're going to see a lot of gains for Republicans this cycle, no, no doubt. Yeah, and please, you know, as far as the media is concerned and the White House is concerned, spare me that this is some matter of of deep principle and concern about rising anti-Semitism. This is of a piece. Over the weekend, Trump had a rally in Ohio where he said it would be a bloodbath. It's going to be a bloodbath if we don't win the election. And he also said that. Well, he said, well, wait, wait, my reading of. Wait, wait. And he said that the migrants coming into the country, some of them are not people. And we got to see the lather, rinse, repeat cycle of Trump comments, right? So Trump says something. People in the media and Democrats say, this is outrageous. This is shocking. How can he say this bloodbath using this kind of rhetoric? And then Trump defenders come forward and say, you're taking it out of context. That's not what he was talking about. You're just lying about Donald Trump. And it is exactly what we went through in 2016 and 2020, which is both sides have a point, but the ratcheting up for Trump, he gets a twofer. So it's a double dog whistle. So when you use that kind of rhetoric, you are speaking to, I mean, it was at an event where the, they played the national anthem sung by the January 6th choir. So to, to that community, Trump gets, he can, he can send them that message. But then by the over-interpretation and freak out that happens in the media, he gets to stimulate the antibodies of the anti-anti-Trump Republicans who say, oh, no, 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 you're taking it out of context. And get, and so Trump gets both things. He gets to both talk to the January 6th choir enthusiast community and ratchet up the Trump is a victim of the mainstream media. It's He gets it all. I will say, I do think there's a downside, which is that to the extent that Trump is the focus and Trump is a major story in the press, i.e. Trump said this, Trump said bloodbath, yep. Trump said that. And our, actually, we're, we're going to talk about Trump 
Trump's claim that 2024 will be rigged. I, I think that hurts Trump. And to the extent that Biden is in the headlines, that hurts Biden. Yep. And so there's clearly an effort on the part of the mainstream media to make Trump the centerpiece because his who's the audience, you know, for these for these sorts of comments. Right. It is not independent, the independent voters he needs to win over. And so I, I do think overall it, it hurts Trump. The, there is one thing, as I've often said, there is one thing on which Donald Trump, the Democratic Party and the mainstream media agree, which is that Donald Trump should be the center of every story about the 2024 election. And that's that's where it's at. Speaking, you you mentioned the claims of rigatude, and the Wall Street Journal has a kind of puzzling piece. Trump claims 2024 will be rigged, putting Republican turnout at risk. Now, this is, I think the story misses because what Trump is saying, Trump's new slogan, and it's got to rhyme if it's Trump, we want to turn out too big to rig. So he's trying to take claims, false claims, of the rigged 2020 election and say, what we're going to have to do because it's rigged is vote by mail. We're going to have to vote early. We're going to have to do everything that we can so that the landslide is so big that it can't be stolen. So he's sort of settled on a, a way in between, and he's settled on it in response to efforts from the professional politicos around him, like Chris LaCivita and Susie Wiles and a number of people who point out the obvious problem, which is, if you tell your voters, who are a lot of them older, you can't vote by mail, you're going to miss out on votes. And when you have states that in 2020 were decided by 10 or 15,000 votes, you can't, you can't leave anything on the table. So I think the, the journal piece misses what the Republicans are trying to do, which is to find a, find a, a middle way. And at the core of that is, and we talked about this last week, Trump's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, who with La Civita has taken the helm at the Republican National Committee. And I thought and wrote a piece about this. Oh, this is, you know, Democrats should beware if they're being professional and they're trying to do it. They're trying to make this happen and really make banking early vote and ballot harvesting and everything a big focus. That's something Democrats should be worried about. But then I saw this, that Laura Trump went on with, do you know who Alex Stein is? So she went on, and I apologize for not being familiar with these outlets, but she went on what appears to be a, a right-wing wackadoo video podcast that included somebody lighting a baby on fire. Lighting, she, he gave her a doll baby and then lit the doll on fire, slammed it, and repeatedly hit it in the head with a Biden shoe, a shoe marked by Biden. And it speaks to the same problem as going on Sebastian Gorka's show, which is if you want to be taken seriously and you want to be and you want to be looked at as like, oh, okay, it's you're professionalizing, you're being normal, you can't go on places like this. You can't go on with Sebastian Gorka. You can't go on places where they light baby dolls on fire. It's, it's, it's this, it's the messaging problem is maybe I'll put it this way. And then I promise I'll shut up. Biden has a problem, which is his base is not giving him room to run right on Israel, on a host of problems, on a host of, on policing, on a host, on the border. Biden is afraid of his base and therefore not pivoting to the middle in the way that he should. But Trump is doing the same thing. The Trumps are doing the same thing, which is the people who are lighting baby dolls on fire should not need to be encouraged to vote <laughs> for Donald Trump, right? They should not, it, it, they, they shouldn't need any care and feeding. They should be self-sustaining on their own, leaving Republicans to appeal to the middle. And this is one of, it's a media problem where the baby doll igniters and the, their counterparts on the left they need content and they want content that sucks up to their people constantly. And if they're not fed always, they're going to get ouchy and they're going to be complaining. And this is one of the many problems that come from siloed media. 
on this Wall Street Journal 2024, uh, Trump's remarks on too big to rig, in my view, it, the message is a mistake. You know, he should be running against Biden's record and what he's going to do differently. The looking back at 2020 and what happened in 2020 is backward looking and he really should be running with a forward looking message. And I just think this is the wrong message to run on, that it's a problem for him. Yeah, but he's not going to be able to, like, here, here's the thing. Trump's incontinence, his messaging incontinence is the problem. And that's what Democrats are basically counting on, is that he can't not do it. And one of the challenges he faces, he had such an easy time of winning the nomination for a third time, that he's not afraid, right? And when he sees polls that say, oh, and we have a new slew of Siena College swing state polls out, Trump's up three points, Trump's up four points in these swing states. And he's not, his his indiscipline is made worse by the fact that he thinks he's a shoo-in. Well, speaking of some of his troubles. This is so good. We have a a really interesting story in the Washington Post. The headline is how a sleuth defense attorney and a disgruntled law partner damaged the Trump Georgia case. And this is about the Fonnie Willis case in Georgia and how her affair and relationship with Nathan Wade saw the light of day. And one of the really interesting things is that the defendant who brought this to light is a longtime Republican opposition researcher, Mike Roman. Um, but let, let, let me read a little bit from this piece. Glance at a Fulton County budget website with some basic numbers showed that Wade had already been paid nearly $550,000. And this is by Fulton County, thanks to Fonnie Willis bringing him on. His law partners, Christopher Campbell and Terrence Bradley, were also under contract with the office, and they had been paid close to $200,000 combined. And Roman's lawyer filed a request seeking those billing statements. Wade's earnings seemed excessive to Merchant, who claimed in recent public testimony that most lawyers appointed to handle public cases are paid far far less, closer to $60 an hour in her experience, or work on a pro bono basis. Prosecutors later argued that Wade's $250 an hour billing rate was below market and less than he'd charged on other cases. By then, chatter about Wade's legal credentials and earnings was spreading among local attorneys unaffiliated with the case. This is a worthwhile victory lap. I'm I'm usually opposed to newspapers taking or news outlets taking victory laps and sharing their notes. But I found this totally fascinating and well-deserved for the Washington Post that that leaned in on this story, the soap operatic story of Fonnie Willis and her paramour and the case and all of that stuff. The Post, we talked about it before, was in, in early on this and went pretty hard. And this it's I find it as a stained wretch. Fascinating to sort of, oh, this is how it happened. This is why we know what we know. And the Post did quite a lot to drive the story forward. And I think they deserve a little victory lap here. Up next, we have Mark <laughs> Levin. <laughs> this is my fault. I just, it it tickled me. Headline, media, Mark Levin demands to know why Republican billionaires aren't posting Trump's $454 million bond. Quote, this is an outrage. And Fox News host Mark Levin believes that Republican billionaires should be ponying up Trump's legal fees. And I just why are the why are there no Republican multibillionaires offering to lend President Trump the funds to file his appeal in the outrageous case in New York State? Levin posted, are none of them liquid enough to help or join with others to help? This is an outrage. This goes back to your previous point, which is. This is not the message, right? This is not this is not the message. The message is not we must help Donald Trump with his legal fees and I will I will promise you and as we're recording this it's unclear what will happen with Trump's efforts to get the bond reduced and on appeal and you know the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of legal fees that Trump has. This is the next chapter in how the the story of Trump's criminal cases and litigation will play out, which is to say people will raise questions about how he's getting the money. So just imagine what it would be if, you know, pick a pick a Republican billionaire of your of your if the, the I'm sorry, the business uh, equipment people from Wisconsin. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on their name. Uline. 
Yeah. So if the Uline said, yeah, we'll just, we'll just, we'll, we'll pony up the money. That's not, that doesn't look good. That's not like, oh, okay, good, good job. You've helped Donald Trump out. It's Donald Trump is in the pocket of these billionaires. So this is, this, that's not the message that works. That's part of it. The other part of it is there, there are other things that these people want to give money to. Presumably, uh, a lot of Senate seats up for grabs, a lot of uh, the House is up for grabs. I can't imagine that this is at the top of the priority list. Republicans can't complain about the consequences of nominating Donald Trump any more than Democrats could complain in 2016 about the consequences of nominating H Hillary Clinton. It's a choice they made. That was the pick. It had to be Trump. So they got Trump. They nominated a guy with huge legal problems. You got to lump it, right? That's 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 the reality. You can't scream about Hillary Clinton's email, the coverage of Hillary Clinton's emails, or the discussion of Donald Trump's lawsuits. To your point, you have to try to keep the focus on Joe Biden because Joe Biden loses an election about Joe Biden. Donald Trump loses an election about Donald Trump. The other sort of, I don't want to say remarkably stupid because Levin is not a stupid guy, but the Republican billionaire class was not for Trump. So they are not going to be the first people to come out and, you know, get him off the hook in this in this bond thing. You know, they they were for DeSantis and Nikki, yep. as my understanding. Pretty, pretty clearly. And the this kind of dear leaderism is just it's it's foolish. Well, what about Trump suing ABC and, and George Stephanopoulos alleging defamation over George Stephanopoulos's interview with Nancy Mace? And we should play a clip from that interview in the exchange in question. Let, let's listen to that. I still get judged for it today. I'm asking you a very simple question. It, and I answered Explain it. You're why, shaming no, me for my not, political I'm, choices. I'm asking you a question about why you endorse someone who's been found liable for rape. Just it was not a criminal court. This was, this it was, was a, a civil court. It was a civil court. court. And by the way, she joked about the judgment and what she was going to do with all that money. And I find that offensive. I'm asking you but about as the a rape victim who's been shamed for years now because of her rape. You're trying to shame me again by asking you've, me this you've political repeated question. That, you've repeated that again I think again, it's offensive. As a woman, I find, her, I find it offensive. All right. So George Stephanopoulos being very testy with Nancy Mace and pressing her as a rape survivor and all of that. I don't know about the legal. I, I doubt that there is a defamation, a, a solid defamation case to be made here. But I flag this mostly as the effort that will be ongoing, right? So the, the and I'm putting air quotes as I say this, chilling effect that the Trump campaign will hope to have in commentary about Trump, which is to say, if you say things about Donald Trump having been found to have, I forget what they said, assaulted, what, whatever it was, his, that he attacked E. Jean Carroll and then defamed her, that talking about that comes at a high legal price. Chris, this might have been my favorite news story of the week, which was the re Pretty amazing. release of the full Don Lemon interview with Elon Musk. And at the Beacon, we condense that into the, sort of the four best minutes, the highlights or lowlights of, of this interview. So let's, let's listen to a little bit of that. But CNN is generally considered left, yeah. Why do you say that? What, why do I say CNN is generally considered left? Uh, I think if, if you look at any sort of media survey of what is on the left or right, I think they would say, like, for example, Fox is on the right and CNN is on the left. Yeah. So that's what... Is it, Am I missing something here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you've admitted that you've had, you have a ketamine prescription. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that for? Well, I mean, it's pretty private to ask somebody about a medical prescription, you know. Do you ever worry that this may get in the way of your government contracts and clearances? And, and also, no. and Wall Street as well. As I mentioned, we had, we had the best-selling car on Earth last year. Um, so for, for an investor standpoint, if there is something I'm taking, I should keep taking it. You're putting your thumb on the scale for moderating hate speech. I mean, you don't put out child pornography, that's not, it's illegal. Chris, a couple things struck me about this. The The first is that Elon Musk, and I've gone back and forth about him, and I, I'm in the middle of the Walter Isaacson biography of him right now, 
which is pretty interesting. And I know that the book has gotten mixed reviews, but I think it's worthwhile in terms of getting some insight into into Musk. He's not a media guy and he's clumsy about these things. And I'm not sure he was knew what he was getting into when when he said, sure, we'll we'll host a Don Lemon show on our platform. But he certainly came to understand quickly when he sat down with Don Lemon for this interview and realized he had he had made a mistake here. And watching this whole thing, which I did, you know, I'm with Elon, like the guy was totally insufferable, arguing with him over the contention that CNN has a liberal bias over the contention that he, Don Lemon, is a liberal and any number of other things. It was like totally gaslighting. And then the New York Post had this amazing story that Don Lemon, the headline is, Don Lemon demanded Tesla Cybertruck $5 million advance equity in X before Elon Musk canned him. And the story reads, Don Lemon demanded the sun, the moon, and the stars from SpaceX boss before being unceremoniously dumped this week, the Post had learned. Has learned the ex CNN anchor sent over an astronomical wish list to Elon Musk during contract talks to host a show on the billionaire social media platform X, including a free Tesla Cybertruck, a $5 million upfront payment on top of an $8 million salary, an equity stake in the multi billion dollar company, and the right to approve any changes in X policy as it relates to news content, according to a document reviewed by the Post. Just amazing. Just amazing. Mwah. The Don Don Lemon, who was paid, I forget how much, how many tens of millions of dollars to stop twenty seven appe- million to stop appearing on CNN. He was paid that much money to stop appearing on CNN. Believed that he deserved not eight million dollars a year and equity in the in X to work there is just uh, know your worth, man. Know your worth, Chris. Up next, we have the foundation that took on (laughs) the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Award, canceling their gala after backlash from her family when they bestowed the awards on Elon Musk and Rupert Murdoch. And the foundation is the Opperman Foundation. Yes. And so she, the woman running it is Julie Opperman. And she says, Julie Opperman, the chair of the Dwight D. Opperman Foundation, released a statement through a spokesperson Monday explaining the decision to recognize Musk, the owner of X, Murdoch, the conservative media mogul, among this year's winners of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Leadership Award, known as the RBG Award. And she stood by the decision and Ginsburg's family said that it strayed far from the original mission of the award and from what Justice Ginsburg stood for. And in my reading about this, it it appears that Julie Opperman's, I believe it was her husband, her late husband, was aligned with the family's mission. And Julie Opperman is clearly a more independent thinker. And this whole and the family did not account for that when they entrusted this the Opperman Foundation with giving out these awards. So this appears the, to be a, a sour relation. They would have gotten away with it too, if so when the press release went out, they were holding the event. They had rented space at the Library of Congress, the beautiful Jefferson building of the Library of Congress, not far from where I sit right now. And they had rented space there in order to have this event. And when the press release went out, it was made to seem, and I'm not alleging, it was made to, it, it, people drew the inference that these people were being honored by the Library of Congress. And also, by the way, on the list with Murdoch and Musk were Martha Stewart, Sylvester St- and Sylvester Stallone. So I think it's Stallone's wife. I I'm my I'm looking at it right now. You may be right, but Stallone issued a statement of gratitude for her for being in, included in the list. And when it got picked up as, oh, look, the it's RBG. And it's the Library of Congress, and this should be correct for a liberal audience. You're right, you're right. It is Sylvester Stallone. Grown for Stallone. And the then it was like, why are they giving it to these figures of the right? And now it ends, it ends in tears as the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Award that have canceled their event. 
Stallone, Stallone enthusiasts, hardest hit. But from a bigger picture, I mean, this is something not infrequent where somebody, where giving strays from the intended original purpose, we on the right know this well. You mean the, uh, no. are you suggesting that the Ford Foundation has gone astray from exactly. the, <laughs> the, the original intentions of the Ford family? I can't believe it. Touche. Chris, that brings us to our business news. Mm -hmm. And we have Gannett and McClatchy dropping the Associated Press, which just means that these big owners of local news outlets had contracts with the Associated Press to run Associated Press stories whenever it would fill a hole in their coverage. The Free Beacon does this with Reuters, where if Reuters has a story on some breaking news, we can run it on the Beacon site and it, there's just a Reuters byline on it. And Pointer writes, this is a stunning development in American news media. Gannett, the publisher of USA Today and the largest newspaper chain in the country with more than 200 outlets, announced it will stop using content provided by the Associated Press starting next week. That was the first big shoe to drop. Then the New York Times' Benjamin Mullen and Katie Robertson reported that McClatchy, which owns about 30 newspapers, including the Miami Herald and the Kansas City Star, will stop using some AP services next month. So what do you make of it? The Associated Press is, if you want full spectrum service from the Associated Press, it's very expensive. And for these newspapers, so the suite of services that you buy from, and for television, for news outlets in general, the suite of services that you buy from the Associated Press include, yes, wire copy, the stories from the Associated Press wire that you can run. This is important for state and national news for and international news for these papers that rely on AP reporting to do these things. But it also is election results, AP's vote cast service that is essential on election nights. And it is maybe the most important, certainly on the television side, the most important is the photo service. So you need pictures. What We need a headshot of the uh, former dog catcher of Wolf Snout County that is uh, just won the, the Democratic nomination for Senate in Arkansas. We need photos of all of these things. And the AP photo service is very important. Over the years, and so AP is a, is a cooperative, basically, right? You're a member, you pay all this money into it, and then the AP pays its staff and pays for the rights to things, and then you have access to it. But it's really, really expensive. And over the years, there have been many efforts. I worked at a place one time where they dropped the AP. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. And then News Corp tried to do it too. They tried to start their own version of it, harnessing their international publications. Did not work. This is a problem for AP because, of course, the shrinking pool of subscribers who, who has been hardest hit by the collapse in local and regional news? Well, the AP is certainly on the list uh, because with fewer members and fewer people paying these exorbitant sums, extravagant sums, they're less able to do what they need to do. So I'm going to watch this very, very closely because on the one hand, it is, can Gannett and McClatchy find, can they use, there are competitors, right? Reuters, as you say is a cheaper alternative, but offers less stuff. There are, there are alternatives out there, but I'll be watching that side of it very closely, but I'll also be watching essentially the health of AP because so much of the news business relies on the Associated Press. Yeah, I read this purely as an story of the economics of the industry that yep. Gannett and McClatchy are hurting and don't want to pay for the AP anymore. And as a result, the AP will hurt, as precisely as you said. Yep, and it trickles down. We This is a follow-up, new chapter for Sports Illustrated with plans to keep print. Authentic Brand, this is from The Times, Authentic Brands Corp., which owns the intellectual property rights to Sports Illustrated, as well as to celebrities like Marilyn Monroe and Muhammad Ali, said it had struck a long-term deal to license Sports Illustrated's publishing rights to Minute Media, a digitally-themed sports company, a digitally-themed company focused on sports. Who cares? I don't know, but we 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 flagged it before about the legacy brand question, and this relates back to stories we've talked about, about the LA Times, the Washington Post, other high-end, well-known brands that 
are valuable as a nameplate, but increasingly less valuable as content generation. And this is for, for, and in this case, legacy media really applies how to, how, how new owners can get revenue from these places, but still try to do some journalism is not easy. No. And the same thing has happened in Newsweek and the New Republic Mm -hmm. and a host of other publications that had a brand name that people came in and essentially bought for the name, for the name brand. It's just a real boon to nostalgic dudes who think back to the swimsuit editions of their adolescence and will be, <laughs> will be glad to know that the swimsuit edition will still be coming out in print to hide in their, to hide in their tool sheds. Chris, that brings us to our Basil Files uh, this week. Primo. And you had flagged a Reuters story. Gloomy youth pull U.S. and Western Europe down global happiness ranking. Oh, I hate it. So Rising much. unhappiness among younger people has caused the United States and some large Western European countries to fall down a global well-being index, while Nordic nations uh, retain their grip on the top spots. Uh oh. Well, let's start with how much I hate the happiness index. The self-reported, totally unscientific goofball survey. How are you feeling? Are you feeling good? Compared to what, homie? Compare, what, compared to what? Compared to yesterday, compared to how I want to feel, compared to whatever. And the happiness index adds more pseudoscientific garbage by factoring in what they believe should make people happy. I have a real sore spot about this as a West Virginian because West Virginia always ranks low in, in state happiness ratings because people have health problems and because a lot of people are poor, that is not, we're, we're talking about two different things. So I, I, hate the, I, ha- I hate the concept of a happiness index. And by the way, I wonder why Nordic countries are excel in these measures compared to other places. It certainly can't be that they have small, homogeneous, wealthy populations with strong social ties. It, it, it can't be that. It certainly can't be that. It must be something else. But what really chaps me about this is <clears throat> the United States, here's the piece, the United States dropped out of the top 20 for the first time, falling to 23rd place from 15th last year. Very scientific. Due to a big drop in a sense of well-being of Americans aged under 30, the report shows. And they talked to an expert who says a range of factors was likely to be lowering young people's happiness, including increased polarization over social issues, negative aspects of social media, and economic inequality. Not mentioned, not mentioned is the news. Not mentioned is the fact that all of the facile, doomsaying, clickbait, hot garbage that is pumped out of newsrooms across this country day in and day out about what a catastrophe everything is, how bad everything is all the time. I wonder, I wonder if that has any effect whatsoever on how people think about the future. And this is a particular bugaboo of mine, but when journalists act like they have no effect on the things that they're doing, this is the microcosm of this is when a reporter asks a public figure, there's a lot of controversy around X, Y, Z. Yeah, controversy that you're helping create, right? It didn't just it didn't just appear. People didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm very concerned about this. The failure of the media to take ownership of the ways in which doomsaying, catastrophized, anti-American, anti-everything coverage has negative effects is just is compounds the error of focusing on happiness, air quotes again, as a scientifically measurable problem, then when they look to place the blame, they don't blame themselves at all. They blame social media. And I'm sick of it. I want to rant about something adjacent to that that I think is overlooked here, which is the impact of school closures on young people. And it's something I hear a lot. It's both young children high school students whose you know time in high school which is supposed to be a happy time in kids lives was 
disrupted. And the college experience of many kids in their late teens and early 20s were disrupted and by major school closures in the U.S. by COVID. And this caused tons of follow on effects for young kids that was stoked by the doomsaying in the news media. Yes. And the political establishment in the U.S. and had major, major, major educational and emotional and psychological impacts on young people in this country. And I hear about it from kids we interview at The Beacon, from kids um, who do fellowships that I'm connected with. It had just an enormous impact on young people in this country. Yes, yes. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. But not listed here in in the problem it must be it must be something else it can't be us yeah i mean kids who attended virtual high school graduations didn't have proms didn't have you know the normal experiences that they should have had i've had kids tell me that they're going to go to grad school for a couple of years because they didn't have college experiences their college years were stolen from them by covid and so on and so forth Anyhow, yeah. Um, listen, as a matter of fact, listening to young people, you hear the story, right? That who who carries the mark, right? Oh, you missed that. Well, I got this. You didn't get to go on the class trip, but you didn't get to do that. And it's this will continue to move through our population in the same way. September 11th, right? Move has moved through our population, and. The way that the response to these things or the or the panic of 2008 and the resulting recession, these things have long tails. Chris, next up, you flagged how broadcast TV networks covered climate change in 2023. And all I needed to know was that it was a media matters it does, piece. It doesn't get more facile than this. And this is. They write, 2023 uh, was the hottest year on record and it was not even close. Testifying to this calamitous milestone were record-breaking extreme weather events and a record number of billion-dollar disasters from searing heat waves to droughts, torrential rains to raging wildfires and plumes of smoke. And unless you think, based on listening to this podcast, that there has been a lot of coverage of this in the mainstream media, Media Matters is here to tell you otherwise. They write, during this pivotal moment, however... Corporate broadcast networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox Broadcasting Co. scaled back their climate coverage by 25%, representing a marked decrease in 2023 from the improvements made in 2021 and 2022, and so on and so forth. I know you want to rant about this, but the amusing thing about this to me was that, you know, these are businesses, they are ratings-driven organizations, and the conclusion is people don't care doesn't rate. Well, let me begin with a very specific complaint, the unanchored statistic. The specific complaint is that it went down 25%. Wow, that seems like a lot, a quarter less coverage. That that must be significant. What did it go from? Went from 1% to less than 1%. So the this is how unanchored statistics are used to create, especially when we talk about percent increases and percent decreases, the unanchored statistic is used to mislead audiences, right? It was a 300% increase in the number of capybara uh, encounters that happened in uh, Maine. Yes, it went from one to three, or one to four. Yes, it was a 300% increase that happened. So they use an unanchored statistic to scaremonger this story. But here's the other thing. People learn to live with bad news. Every year in the United States, some 40,000 Americans are killed in traffic deaths. How many Americans every year drink themselves to death? How many, we, we, catastrophe is all around us. What we do after we are confronted with catastrophe for long enough is say, yep, okay, that's life. That's, that's part of what we, we become inured to it. And the idea that what these networks should be doing is every year ratcheting up the alarm about climate change and that it shouldn't be 1%, but that it should be, I, I, don't know what the, I don't know what Media Matters thinks the correct amount of incendiary, pardon the pun, climate coverage should be. But the message is, yes, for years and years, for decades, people have talked about the problem with climate change. And every year we're treated to a new round of stories about it. 
viewers, readers, listeners, voters have priced in now. Yeah, I guess the earth will be consumed in a giant ball of fire, but it doesn't appear like there's anything that we are doing about it or can doing about it. So what should these news outlets do? Just talk about it all the time? This is this is uncut, pure, facile. Chris, that brings us to the style section. Yes. And the Wall Street Journal had an amusing piece headlined, The Couples Embracing the Dink Label. Now, what is dink, you might ask? It is dual income, no kids. And they write, the dual income, no kids moniker is suddenly everywhere. And the lexicon is ballooned to include dinkwads, sinks, and dinos. (laughs) And they quote a man named Keldon Fisher, who says, I really enjoy being a dink, says Keldon, a 30-year-old software engineer. His wife, Natalie Fisher, says, being dinks means we just have a lot of freedom, time, and money. She's open to having children, but is first focused on building a net worth of $1 million by age 30. I know that once I have a, a kid, I will have to assume a lot of the caregiving responsibility and work less. Dink wads are dinks with a dog. Oh, my God. Sinks are single income, no kids. And some dinks prefer dino, dual income, no offspring. And oh. dinky is dual income, no kids yet. Amazing. Wow. I had never heard this term, but apparently it's everywhere. So if you hear it now, you're going to know what it means. Welcome in, Dinks. Welcome in. It's amazing. Okay. That brings us to our obsessions of the week. Where we break down the stories we can't get out of our heads. And Chris, mine was a piece from Semaphore. Very few have balls. How American news lost its nerve. And they write that A landscape of gleefully revelatory magazine exposés, aggressive newspaper investigations, feral online confrontations, and painstaking television investigations has been eroded by a confluence of factors, from risks, rising risks of litigation and costs of insurance, which strap media companies can hardly afford, to social media, which has given public figures growing leverage over the journalists who now increasingly carry their water, The result is a thousand stories you'll never read and a shrinking number of publications with the resources and guts to confront power. Okay. Maybe, maybe there is a little bit of truth to this story in that what came to mind for me when I read this was the New York Post being bullied out of running the plagiarism story against Claudine Gay because they got a BS again, a BS defamation threat from a high-priced lawyer, but again, it, not a real threat, and they were cowardly, but there was no actual risk of litigation. And a couple of thoughts on this. First, what's not in here is maybe the quality of journalists has gone down. Maybe journalists are not that good. Maybe their editors are not that good. And Given that, he says, you know, social media, so public figures can hit back. Well, maybe these stories shouldn't have come out in the first place if they can't, like, pass muster against people being able to push back against them. And finally, maybe, maybe we have a Democratic administration right now and these journalists are not as incentivized to do hard-hitting investigative reports on the Biden administration, because I have a feeling if Donald Trump wins re-election, we will suddenly see a rebirth of investigative news stories and this problem will go away. I I really have a feeling. And and I I did not really see much of a shout out in here to the people continuing to do hard hitting investigative reports of, of which there are many. I I think the yes, I I I concur. And again, Blaming social media for problems that exist in the traditional media is a, a theme that we see repeated uh, over over and over again. And I do think it's true that we are in a new space of sorting out, as we talked about with Trump's suit against ABC. Courts are involved. 
There's a lot, there's a lot that's involved. You know, I've been, it's gone both ways in my career. I've had amazing moments where publications I worked for backed me to the hilt and incurred substantial legal costs in support of my reporting. I have had it go the other way too. And the, the, the truth is that doing grown up journalism and letting people go where the stories take them comes with costs and people don't want to pay those costs. But I, I absolutely agree that the, the idea that this is unrelated to problems of bias in the press is a, a, a glare. It is the dog that did not bark in this piece. What is your obsession, Chris? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> all right. So in August, in August of 2016, there was a famous piece in the New York Times that said Trump, li basically it says Trump lies and violates the rules. Journalists will have to violate the rules in order to cover him. And it was a, it was a little permission slip. I wrote about this in my book, Broken News, where it was a permission slip to journalists basically to say, well, he's throwing the rule book out the window. We, <clears throat> we have to throw the rule book out the window too. How did that work? Poorly, as it turned out, extraordinarily poorly. So we have the bookend to that piece in the New York Times, how Trump's allies are winning the war over disinformation. And it goes on and on and on and talking about how there was this magic moment after January 6th where it seemed finally that the federal government, private entities would team up to fight disinformation, but they were defeated in their effort to bring government power to bear on the question of disinformation and misinformation. And I was so obsessed over this, I wrote my whole Dispatch Tuesday column about this. The idea, so basically it goes like this. There were, there were a pair of cases at the Supreme Court this week that were dealing with these kinds of questions. One was about the New York Attorney General, or New York Department of Financial Services or whatever, trying to scare people away from doing, insurers from doing business with the NRA. That seems pretty straightforward, you, that the government can't do that. More complicated one involves the attorneys general of Louisiana and Missouri, who were, who want to sue, who are suing the federal government for jawboning social media sites into taking down posts about Trump's false claims about the election or COVID. And on both, on both sides of this, so on the, on the right wing side of this, you have these folks who say that people have to be forced basically to carry content they don't want. That, the, it, that Facebook or Meta or X or TikTok or whatever have to host speech that they don't want to host. On the other side, and of course that is preposterous because the First Amendment makes it clear, not speaking <laughs> is your right to. You can't be compelled to, to carry the speech of other people forward. On the other side, we have this disinformation and misinformation stuff, which is that you that the government has a role to play in policing speech and forcing people to take down so the short form is the right wants companies to be forced to leave speech up and the left wants companies to be forced to take speech down and in both cases they just plow right into the first amendment because you just can't get around it it's not section 230 it's not something new it's something old which is the, the desire of people for the government to police speech is so longstanding that when they, when, in order to pass the Constitution, they needed a Bill of Rights. And in the first one is the government can't police the, the speech of its citizens. And the, the, the thing that's galling about this New York Times piece is it's like, that's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. You're the New York Times. You're writing for the most influential publication in the world. You want to fight disinformation? Go fight disinformation. Go do that. And the New York Times, by the way, does a lot of that. To their credit, they are, they are chasing down stories and reporting stuff and spending substantial resources. But don't complain that the government is not helping you do your job, right? Because the government's job is... Ha it has to be limited to, and I'm, I made the point, now shut up, I promise. But I made the point about flip it around. 
What if Stephen Miller of the of the Trump administration had been cooperating with media outlets on speech about Black Lives Matter or speech about in, environmental radicalism or speech about anti-Israel people? And he was cooperating to fight disinformation that could lead to violence from people in this space. What would the, by the way, correct response from the New York Times be? This is outrageous. They can't be doing it. This is jawboning. This is shadow censorship. They can't do this stuff. So just rem I would just tell everybody, however you think the government ought to be involved in policing people's speech, remember it won't always be people you like. And if you give the government power to police speech, directly or indirectly, it will be used against you later. So just do your job, put out the truth, fight the good fight, stay out there in the trenches. This is not a part of the government's job. There were a couple things that really bothered me about this piece. The first is there's a sort of like tacit premise that if Trump wins again, his victory in the disinformation wars will be a big part of it, that he will have won because people were misinformed or disinformed, which is BS and patronizing. And the second was there was so little grappling with the fact that the guardians of disinformation, mis misinformation have totally discredited themselves by trying to stamp out what is in fact true newsworthy information. And they go on to quote Nina Jankowitz, a researcher who in 2022 briefly served as the exec executive director of a short-lived DHS advisory board on disinformation, you know, which people were critical of. They didn't want a government body policing information and misinformation and who herself had been critical of true news stories that were put out because they were harmful to Democrats. And there's just no grappling with the fact that these people have totally discredited themselves and proved untrustworthy in the eyes of so many people. Yeah. I'm, again, it's not, it can't be us. This is a, a, not us, right? <laughs> this, this has to be somebody else's mistake. This has to be somebody else's problem. And I read this piece is basically, so you lost, right? So who lost? You lost because you don't feel you don't feel like you are getting the outcomes that you want. So that's on you. That's on us, right? <clears throat> and that's why I'm proud to work in the places that I work at the American Enterprise Institute, the Dispatch, and News Nation, and doing the work that we do, because the answer to bad speech, right, and wrong speech and misinformation is good speech and reliable information. This is where the the battle of ideas has to be fought. This is in the marketplace of ideas. And just the last thing I'll say before I shut up, I promise, is if we cannot trust voters to make up their own minds, it's game over anyway, right? If we have concluded that the American people have to be spoon-fed correct information in order to make the correct choices, then the premise of self-government is already over. So you have to accept the fact that this is a nation in which the government derives its authority from the consent of the governed. And if the, if the, if the people, if the governed are deemed incapable of reaching conclusions about things, then go plant turnips because it's all, it's all over baby blue. Chris, that brings us to my favorite time of the week, which is reader mail. And we had a very helpful eagle-eyed listener. You didn't really have to be that eagle-eyed or eared to spot my mistake. Austin Bird from Denver writes, El Rechos, I must sadly correct you on a point from this week's podcast, which is now last week's episode. Lee Bollinger invited Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to speak at Columbia in 2007, not Khomeini. So thank you. That was my mistake. I, like Barry Weiss, was an undergraduate at Columbia at the time and rabble roused with veterans. I was not yet a veteran, but a Marine officer candidate, part of the small conservative faction on campus and a small number of sane other students to protest the invitation. Bollinger's argument at the time was a very roundabout, we must listen even to the speech with which we disagree sort of bunk and said it was important that we engaged in dialogue. Of course, Ahmadinejad was in town to speak, rail, I should say, at the United Nations and was in no need of an additional platform. 
in particularly poor form. Bollinger allowed the speech to continue and promptly criticized the speaker that he himself had insisted upon inviting. As explained in an excellent tablet article by Armin Rosen, who was also an undergraduate and was fortunate enough to procure a ticket, quote, Bollinger apparently believed he'd get credit both for allowing the event to take place and for eloquently denouncing its horrific headliner. Instead, he discovered practically in real time that free speech and institutional image, not to men- mention basic decency, were in naked conflict with one another, end quote. Bollinger always had a Biden-esque quality of tacking to whatever position was convenient. It's often overlooked that he, ever one to genuflect before the First Amendment, advocated for campus speech codes earlier in his career. With that being said, the substance of what he said in the quote today is fair. I'll close with a screen cap. The article is thankfully gone to the wind and the link is dead of the article I wrote for Town Hall at the time. The The title was, shall we say, intemperate, yours in wretchedness. And the headline of the article that our uh, letter writer, Austin Bird, wrote was, Columbia, why are you so stupid? <laughs> well. So thank you for the correction and apologies thank you for, the, for correct- the error. And and Mr. Bird, thank you for your self-reference. We can certainly forgive intemperance in headline writing for young men who are riled up. So don't don't judge yourself too harshly. Our next letter is from Gwen Stokels in Alexandria, who writes, I am a regular listener and thought I'd share today's lighthearted West Wing playbook in case you missed it. Specifically, I would direct your attention to the first section in the newsletter, Eli Needs Help, written by Eli Stokels. First, full disclosure, Eli is my cousin, but you'll decide for yourselves if you like the article. The story is about Eli's trip to the basement of the EEOB to sample the lunchtime buffet at Ike's Cafe, I couldn't help but think of Chris when I got to Eli's description of the Reuben. I hope you enjoy the article as much as I did. Oh, this is a a good Reuben description. (laughs) I bite into the Reuben, he writes. Okay, so it's not Katz's, but I'm also not eating into my kid's college fund and the sandwich is satisfying. Proportionally, there may be a touch more kraut than necessary, but everything else is is nails. The Russian dressing, the softness of the lightly buttered bread, the temptation to inhale the whole thing. With uncharacteristic restraint, I leave half of the Reuben uneaten beside the heap of Old Bay dusted fries, a tad thick and slightly undersalted, but still easy enough to polish off and unwrap the grilled chicken sandwich. Good God, he says, what am I doing? I'm eating the second half of the Reuben now. I tell myself I just want to see how it holds up after sitting a bit longer, and it's actually better now. But I see my escort chaperone across the table and imagine they're privately horrified. I stop after two bites. Cousin Eli, I feel you. I <clears throat> I definitely feel you. Who could who could turn away a delicious Reuben? One of the great sandwich experiences of them all. I I I join you in gluttony. Chris, that brings us to our your favorite time of the week. When I am forced to say something nice. But please Lead us by example. Well, it's it's not it's not a favorite uh, in in the pure sense because it's very sad. But to note, one year has passed of Wash of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gersh, Gerskowitz Gerskowitz and his imprisonment in Russia. And I've included a piece from the Times of London recounting all of that. And anniversaries are a good time to think about these things. So keep a prayer for and keep support for Evan. Chris, my favorite article was a no brainer and we are coming full circle back to Don Lemon. The callback. The New York Post in an exclusive piece notes reveals that Don Lemon wanted a free ride on Elon Musk's rocket to host the first podcast in space as part of a wild list of demands, according to sources. Don Lemon, who submitted a wish list that included demands for a free Cybertruck in contract talks with X before he was unceremoniously dumped last week, also wanted SpaceX X boss, boss Elon Musk to launch him into orbit for the first ever extraterrestrial podcast, the Post has learned. First podcast in space to be hosted by Don via SpaceX. The bulleted Maybe. line item reads, the literally out of this world ask was on a document Lemon's agents at United Talent Agency sent to Musk's social media site that also included demands for a $5 million advance, blah, 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 blah. Amazing, amazing story. 
just they they they've said Don it's Lemon, called chutzpah. It's called chutzpah. I mean, I gotta say, I've never had an agent, and who knows what I I I might be able to do my work from orbit if I really was leaning in on this. Well, Chris, that is all the time we have for the news about the news. If you have a story you want us to talk about, email us at wretches at nebulouspodcasts.com and sign up for our newsletter at nebulouspodcasts.com. This has been Ink Stained Wretches from Nebulous Media, produced by Colin Chicola. Yeah. Find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Wretches. Wretches.